Welcome to PICC Busan's Sunday service. We're so glad that you can join with us. Today we will be looking at Matthew 1 verse 18 to 24. We will look at the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ through the eyes of Joseph. We find that Matthew records the account, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ through the eyes of Joseph and Luke records the events of the birth of Christ through the eyes of Mary. This will be a two-part series. Uh, today we will be focusing on the conception and next Saturday, which is Christmas Day, we will look at the birth of Christ from the account of Luke. Have a look at the description below to skip to the chapters. Enjoy the service with us. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
The last two weeks, we've been preaching about the church, uh, what the church is, who is the church, and what is our role in the church. So today, it was actually supposed to be part three of the church, but I kind of uh, postponed going on with uh, the church and the sermons about the church. Um, I think it's important, especially in the time that we are in, to look at the birth of Jesus. Uh, we all know that next week is Christmas. Uh, it does look a lot like Christmas outside at a lot of places. It even, even is cold, like in other countries, and this country is also cold this time of the year. Where we come from, our Christmas are hot, it's not cold. 
So today and Saturday, yes, remember Saturday, we have service Christmas morning. We've got service at 11, and we also have service next week, Sunday. So today we'll be looking at A Child is Born, part one, and then on Christmas Day, we'll look at the second part. So our scripture reading for today is Matthew 1, verses 18 to 24. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit before they came together. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, He did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Heavenly Father, we we thank you today, Lord, for for your word, God, and thank you that we have this account of the Lord Jesus Christ, a child that is born unto us. Thank you that we have the privilege today, God, by looking at your scriptures and look into your scriptures today, Heavenly Father. uh, We ask and pray, Holy Spirit, that you will illuminate the scriptures to us, and that you will help us to understand these passages in the Bible correctly, Lord, so that we can apply it to our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, especially looking back in history, it's always uh, interesting when we look into the life of someone famous. Usually we want to know uh, where did that person come from, how did they grow up, what did they do, especially if they are famous or a celebrity. And looking in the Bible, uh, here it is no exception. I mean, no one is more noteworthy than the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is why it's important for us today to look at the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ. How did this take place and what happened? And it's interesting, when we look at the four Gospels, we only have two Gospels that records the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's only Matthew and Luke that records the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Their interest in his conception and birth lies in showing that he is the Son of God who became a man by means of the virgin birth. So we see Mark and the book of John, they do not record uh, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And interesting, when we look at the book of Luke, Luke tells the story through the eyes of Mary. So when you read the account of Luke, the birth of Christ, it is Uh, written through the eyes of Luke, whereas Matthew records it from Joseph's point of view. So interesting, we've got two accounts, uh, the birth accounts of Jesus. One looks through the eyes of Mary uh, in the book of Luke, and in the book of Matthew, we look through the eyes of Joseph. So we will look at the conception of Jesus through the eyes of Joseph, 
as Matthew recorded it. So today we will look through the, the conception through the eyes of Matthew. And on the birth of Christ, we will look through the eyes of Mary, written by Luke. And um, Matthew here is no one other than the tax collector. Uh, another name for Matthew is Levi. So they've got two names. So this is one of the guys that uh, Jesus told to follow him. So Matthew is giving us uh, an account here of the conception of the birth of Christ through Joseph's eyes. So in the Christian calendar, I think it's synonymous that we know that Christmas and Easter is probably the two most celebrated days on the Christian calendar. Because without the birth of Christ, we will not have Easter. So both of them are important to us as Christians. And regardless of what the world makes this time of the year to be, or exactly when was the date and all of this, the fact still stands that a child was born unto us. A savior was born for us. So that's something that we should always remember this time of the year, that a child is born unto us, regardless of what we see in the world and regardless of what the world makes this time of the year uh, to be. So let's look at verse 18. Uh, follow with me from verse 18. We're going to read verse 18 and verse 19. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And the husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So interesting words for us to look at here. The first one is betrothed to Joseph. So in today's time, it basically means they were engaged. They were engaged in the Jewish culture. They call it betrothed. And although Joseph and Mary were only pledged to be married, in the Jewish culture of the time, engagement was formal. It was a binding agreement that meant that the groom had already paid the bridal price for the bride. So Joseph's family already paid the price for Mary to be his wife. Back home, we have a thing which one of the cultures they call labola. So you pay for your wife with a certain amount of cows or livestock or animals. So this is more or less similar. So Joseph had to pay for Mary. So they were engaged, but he already paid money for her. So he's getting engaged with Mary and she is pregnant. Just imagine what went through Joseph's mind here because even though Mary and Joseph had not uh, engaged in the physical action yet, we see in Genesis 2 verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So Joseph and Mary were not one flesh yet and she was already pregnant. So, since the engagement was, a, was binding as marriage, for Joseph to end uh, this engagement, he needed a formal act of divorce. So, he actually had to go through to divorce Mary because he found that she is actually pregnant. And he knows that they are still not one flesh. They're only in Gage currently. So in this story that we have here, Mary is currently four months pregnant here as she spends three months with Elizabeth, which is one of her relatives. So when the time when Joseph and Mary got betrothed, uh, she was already four months pregnant. 
So we find this, uh, you can read this whole account in Luke 1, verse 59 to 56. You can find this account where Mary went to visit Elizabeth. And here in Luke 1, verse 56, And Mary remained with her for about three months and returned to her home. So we see that Mary stayed with Elizabeth, and when she went home, to get engaged, she was already pregnant. I can just imagine uh, how surprised Joseph uh, was when he saw this. Um, and so, she was found to be with a child from the Holy Spirit, as we see here in scriptures in the last part of verse 18. So, what is going on? On here. So when Joseph and Mary got engaged, he found out that she is pregnant and that the child wasn't his child. And obviously, being human, what's the first thing that will come to your mind if you are in that situation, men? The first thing will be, you would think my wife has committed adultery because she is pregnant and you weren't with her. So this is the first thing that went through Joseph's mind. And interesting enough, according to history, Mary was 14 years old when she was pregnant. Between 14 and 17 years old when she was pregnant. If I'm not mistaken, that was the age back then when they used to have children. So she was basically still a teenager Yeah. So, for now, we should remember, go with me quickly to Deuteronomy 22, verse 23 and 24. So now Joseph saw that his coming wife is pregnant. So he needs to do something now. And in verse 19 of our passage today, And her husband Joseph, being just and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So Joseph thought to himself, all right, I'm just going to get, I'm going to get divorced. I'm just going to resolve this issue quietly. But we should keep the following in the back of our minds. Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 24. And it says the following. If there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets her, in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry for help, though she was in the city, and the man, because he violated, he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. So what's basically what this verse is saying, if the community should find out that Mary is pregnant while be, being betrothed to Joseph, she should actually receive the death penalty. She would, should receive stoning. This is basically what, this is why uh, Joseph thought to himself, being a just man, he will divorce of her quietly. So this is Mary, actually in this case, uh, according to the community around, but we know that she fell pregnant by the Holy Spirit, which is an act of God, and it's not, she wasn't with another man. But the thing is, we didn't know how the community will respond to this. So Joseph thought to himself that he will divorce her quietly, because he doesn't want her to, be, to receive the death penalty. So, but Joseph, being a just and righteous man, thought that he will divorce Mary silently as she can receive the death penalty if someone should find out that she was with another man, which we've said she wasn't because the Holy Spirit uh, made her pregnant. But in this passage, in verse 19, there is something in the way Joseph acts that we can take for ourselves today in verse 19. And it's the following. 
we find no evidence that Joseph got angry, uh, that he felt resentment or bitterness towards Mary. None of those things. This is, some, this is a character trait that we can apply to our own lives as well. We see that he, yeah, there's no evidence of Joseph being angry at what he saw or trying to get revenge because he found that Mary is pregnant. So, and Joseph, being a just man, did not want to disgrace Mary publicly by exposing her supposed sin. Because he loved her so deeply, he deter determined simply to divorce her quietly. Wow, what a just man. He's just going to divorce her quietly without taking revenge. Or he's not even grumbling or or arguing in this passage. He's just, he's accepting, all right, this happened. I'm just going to uh, get divorced quietly. Turn your Bibles with me to Philippians 2 verse 14 quickly. While we're in this passage, while we're looking at this character of, of Joseph. And like I said, this is something for us to take to, at, to heart today. And Philippians 2.14 says the following, Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Among you, you shine as lights in the world. So what are the marks of, of non-Christians? They grumble and complain. What's the marks of Christians? Philippians 2 verse 14. We are not supposed to grumble. We are not supposed to complain. We even see Joseph here. He's not grumbling or complaining. His wife is pregnant. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, there's no place for us to complain when we are Christians. When life happens and things happen to us, we submit that to God and we trust that God will work that out for our good as He controls everything at the end of the day. So we see here Joseph wants to divorce her quietly and he won't tell anyone what's happening here. Verse 20 uh, of 1 Matthew, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So while Joseph was sleeping, an angel appeared to him in a dream, telling him, that the child came from the Holy Spirit, from God Himself. So the angel of the Lord that we have here, this is the angel Gabriel that appeared to Joseph while he was sleeping. And we find this in Luke 1 verse 26. So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So we see the, the angel appearing to Joseph in his dreams was the angel Gabriel. And then the angel said to Joseph, you, you shouldn't be afraid, as this was the work of the Holy Spirit and not of man. Joseph and Mary both knew that Jesus was con uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit. But let's quickly think about this for a second. So it's only Joseph and Mary uh, that knows uh, Mary got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. But how will the community react uh, regarding this? If we should think about this, we just read Deuteronomy 22. So if they should find out that uh, Mary is pregnant, she will receive the death 
penalty. So turn with me, uh, turn with your Bibles to Matthew 1, verse 1. And let's have a look here quickly. So I believe that many outsiders and people who didn't know them probably were gossiping, uh, saying that Mary uh, got pregnant uh, with someone else. We all know how gossip works today. Uh, people gossip about things they usually don't know. They make their own assumptions. And this was probably the case that happened in this conceiving of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in Matthew, let's read Matthew 1 verse 1 quickly, and I'll explain while I went to this passage. So, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abram. Abram was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nason, and Nason the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of uh, Uriah. So I think if you ever if you, don't, if you don't have a name to call your child, Matthew 1 verse 1 gives us a few names if you struggle with names. There's a few names here, but why would Matthew include this in Matthew 1? There's a few names that stands out here in Matthew 1. The first one is Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. But why would Matthew mention women in the genealogy, as it was uncommon for women to be named in genealogies. So when you look in the Bible, if you go through the list of the, the people that were born, you usually don't find women's names in there. But Matthew is doing something here. That's why he's including the names of women in Matthew 1. Let's have a look quickly. Tamar was a Canaanite woman who posed as a prostitute to seduce Judah. We find evidence of this in Genesis 38, verse 13 to 30. We have Rahab, was a Gentile and a prostitute. Joshua 2, verse 1. We have Ruth, she was a Moabite woman and a worshipper of idols. Uh, we find that in Ruth 1, verse 3. And then we have Bathsheba, uh, the wife of Uriah, uh, who committed adultery with David, 2 Samuel 11. So we see Matthew is including women is in his list of uh, the timeline of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the following. Each of these women was at one time the object of scorn for lacking purity and holiness. So they all had a bad past, but God used them, all of these women, to bring His will and plan into action. So this is why Matthew is mentioning these women, because Mary is the mother of Jesus. So the people were obviously gossiping about Mary. So this is why Matthew included these women in Matthew 1 to show, but hey guys, let's have a look at uh, these other women, Rahab. God used Rahab to save the nation of Israel when the walls of Jericho fell down, when the spies went in. Uh, we know that Bathsheba is the, uh, the mother of Solomon, David's son. So God used all of these women the same way He used Mary to give birth to the Lord Jesus Christ because the community 
was probably pointing fingers to Mary and gossiping behind her back. So this is why Matthew included uh, these women in this passage to show that God uses anyone regardless of their past and women because we know that women didn't have any rights um, in these times back then. So this is why Matthew did include them in here. And it's interesting that these women are an object les lesson about the workings of divine grace. And it's the same uh, with us today. God chooses on who he bestows grace and mercy. The same with us today. We are not saved by our own works or by the good works we've done. We are saved uh, because God chose to save us, because he chose to give us grace and mercy and cleanse us from our sins. That is how we receive salvation. So this is, uh, this is why Matthew included these women, because they were probably gossiping about Mary. So he's showing them, but hey guys, look, God used this woman in the same way he used Mary to give birth to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus, Emmanuel, it means the Lord saves. That is what the word Jesus means, the Lord saves. So the name points to Jesus' primary mission as he will save his people from their sins. But we know that Jews were expecting the Messiah to be a political deliverer. But God sent him as a spiritual savior, as the one saving our souls, redeeming us unto himself. This is why God sent Jesus. And the second one, Emmanuel, indicates that Christ would be more than an anointed man. He would be God with us, meaning Jesus would be 100% man and he would be 100% God at the same time. Jesus was an anointed man, but he was much more. He was God in human form. And in verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And here Matthew points out to fulfillments of Old Testament prophecies. And just in Matthew alone, uh, we have quite quite a lot of these prophecies that were fulfilled by the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have Matthew 2.15, uh, 2.17, 2.23. I don't know if it's on the screen. All right, 4.14. Um, there's a lot of them, yeah. So we see that the birth of Jesus fulfilled the prophecies which were made uh, of him many, many years ago. So Matthew is pointing out here that the prophecies came into fulfillment. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. As we know, Jesus came. He was born as a child. He, he lived among us. Uh, he served us. Uh, he showed the glory of God in human form. That's why Jesus came. And then verse, uh, Matthew points here to Old Testament prophecy, like I just said, which would be fulfilled with the birth of Jesus. And we have this in Isaiah 7 verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And in verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. That's radical obedience. 
I mean, when I look at this, like we've just discussed, he was still uh, thinking about divorcing Mary. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, and Joseph did exactly what the angel of the Lord commanded him. He obeyed the words of God, and he acted upon them. This is something for us to take as well today. Even though we have plans, uh, and we make our own plans and things, but when we come to Scripture, and Scripture tells us what to do, we should act uh, what we read in Scripture. So just by quickly looking at the conceiving of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we look um, at Joseph, there's two things that we can take from Joseph today for ourselves as believers. And the first one is, the cost of obedience. We just saw now how obedient Joseph was. He acted immediately. He didn't grumble or complain or ask the angel, but uh, maybe you need to explain it to me a little bit better. The angel of the Lord just said she's uh, pregnant through the Holy Spirit, and he didn't ask any questions. The same with us as believers today. When we find scripture which says, uh, love your enemies as yourself, we should love our enemies as ourselves. We should pray for them. We should, if they're hungry, give them something to eat. When Scripture uh, commands something as, of us, we need to act. We need to obey. And this is exactly what Joseph did here. So, and the other one is Joseph's humility. And, and it's sometimes when somebody did us wrong, uh, we quickly want to act and say, but no, but you were wrong, and I, I want to expose your sins, and so forth. But look at Joseph. He had no uh, remembrance of putting Mary to shame. No, he, he didn't. He loved her so that he just wanted to divorce her and not put her to shame. So for us as believers today, we can take from the life of Joseph, we can take his obedience and his uh, humility for something for us to imitate, to, to say, but uh, I'll ask the Holy Spirit to help me maybe to act in the same way as he did. And then obviously the main point of today's sermon is a child is born unto us. This is why we celebrate Christmas every year. We, we remind ourselves that if the Lord Jesus weren't uh, born for us, we would receive no salvation. And He's the only one that can save us from our sins, save us from our addictions or depression or, or things that we struggle in our life with. It is only through Him that we can obtain these things. But first and foremost, He came to save our souls and to grant us everlasting life. This is why we celebrate Christmas because a child is born unto us. So let's keep this in mind as this, this week, as you go along the week, a child is born unto us. Next Sunday, oh, sorry, Saturday, we will look at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw today that he was conceived through the Holy Spirit. We saw Joseph's obedience and Joseph's humility. So next Saturday, we will look through the eyes of Mary when Jesus was born and exactly what did she experience in that time. Heavenly Father, thank you that we could go into your scriptures today, Lord, and uh, we ask that you will come and remind us, Lord, in this time of the year that this time of the year, Lord, is, is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Like we've said, regardless of what the world makes this time to be, we know that a child was born unto us. For all of those who were predestined to be saved and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you loved us so, Lord, that you sent your one and only Son to come and live among us and to die for us, but not just die, but to give us the ultimate victory when he rose from the grave, where he sits at the right hand of the Father today. And Lord Jesus, we, we look forward to the day when we will see you face to face. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came 
in a human flesh to be with us and be God among us. Holy Spirit, we'll ask that you would uh, water the word uh, in our hearts, that your word will transform us, God, and that we will live the transformed lives that you intend for us to live. We ask that you will help us to obey your commandments, to follow your examples, to confess our sins, Lord, to do all these things, Heavenly Father, as you require this from us, but not out of obligation, God, but because you loved us, Lord, and because we loved you, and we still love you, God, and thank you that you loved us first and died for us while we were still sinners. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Have a wonderful Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your week. We hope to see all of you Saturday morning and Sunday morning. Uh, also, thank you very much for everyone that participated in bringing gifts. Uh, we will go and hand out the gifts next Sunday to our disabled community. Thank you.